Welcome to Just Cook It Radio, where delicious recipes and real cooking lead to amazing dishes. We cook, you listen, it works. With your hosts, Chef Mario Pereca and Bill Alexander. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. You're listening to Just Cook It on the Just Cook It Radio Network. And you can also watch the show at justcookit.tv. I am Mario Pereca, alongside Bill Alexander. And across the desk, we have Jim Morgan. Nice to see you again, Jim. It's been a while. Yes, it has. Nice to be here. Last minute <laughs> substitution so that uh, Mike could take off and go cover a basketball game. Basketball. Lady Commodores this afternoon. There's a breath of fresh air in the studio. <laughs> <laughs> We're just kidding, Mike. We know you're listening on your way to. I was going to say, I smell more like onions, but anyhow, <laughs> may not be a so, breath of fresh air. Um, coming up, we have a very special episode. Yeah, looking forward to this because we've been talking about the book over the last couple of shows, and uh, today's finally here, so we actually get to talk about Lincoln in the Kitchen. Absolutely. Four score and seven years ago. I don't know the rest I of it. <laughs> Our fathers brought forth. Well, I'm there sure that Ray knows more than we do. But I'm sure of it. So we've been talking about this book, Abraham Lincoln in the Kitchen. It's a really interesting read. I've been reading it over the past couple of, uh, couple of weeks now, and we have the author with us. So let me give you a brief description on our guest today. And then we'll let her chime in and uh, t tell us all about her expertise. So Abraham Lincoln in the Kitchen is a culinary biography about Abraham Lincoln. It lets readers peek inside to the everyday life of one of our most beloved presidents and discover the foods he would have cooked in his home. So that's really, really, really interesting. And the author, her name is Ray Catherine Amy. She's an award-winning author and cook. She dynamically interconnects food and history. She's the author of seven books, including Soda Shop Salvation, which we were talking about before. We went on the that air. one sounds really interesting to me too. And uh, food will win the war, and a prairie kitchen. Uh, her work and research brings the textures and flavors of the past to life, and provides a fresh perspective on history. Her blog, What Lincoln Enjoyed Eating, and website, which is RaysKitchen.net, explore both the historic and contemporary culinary worlds. Amy has also won blue ribbons in the Minnesota and Iowa State Fair food competitions. So it is. Uh, we're very excited to have the author of Abraham Lincoln in the Kitchen, the newly released. Abraham Lincoln in the kitchen. Ray, Catherine, Amy. Ray, are you with us? I am. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? I'm just wonderful. Although I was listening to your weather, it's much better than ours out here in St. Paul, Minnesota. It's going to get up to 12 today. That's uh, <laughs> high to, well, we, it, It's been cold here this winter. We got a reprieve this weekend. Yeah, we finally had a thaw. Yeah. Spring so, may actually be here, finally. I heard Robin singing this morning, so I'm keeping my fingers crossed. Well, we can sympathize with you on that end. Well, we're used to it. We're Minnesotans. <laughs> That's right. And you have some ties with Iowa as well. I do, yes. Uh, I went to the University of Iowa, and that's where I met my husband, and uh, have lived there kind of on and off. Um, our travels have taken us to, to the advantage, uh, from a writing perspective, of living all over the eastern half of the United States. So I've lived in uh, New Jersey and in Virginia. We lived in Tuscaloosa, Alabama for a while, lived in Illinois, so um, and Iowa and Minnesota. So we've, I've had an advantage to kind of observe the cuisine of a lot of regions uh, on a daily basis. So that was certainly helpful when I was researching and writing um, this book about Lincoln. Very cool. And a little known fact, Bill, about me, I was actually born in Davenport, Iowa. Really? Yes. I did not know that. So there's some ties there. But I knew there was something wrong, but now I figured it out. <laughs> hey, you got you got two against one here. So. <laughs> born in Iowa and expelled from Canada. I mean, what more yeah, well. can we ask for? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Jeez. moving on. <laughs> we'll just ignore that last part. Um, Abraham Abraham Lincoln in the kitchen. Ray, the first question I want to ask you is um, your interest with Abraham Lincoln. Where did that start? How did it all begin? Well, I, I think like most of us, we encounter Lincoln very early in our elementary school days. And um, when I was a child, I had, had the opportunity to go both with school trips and with my parents down into the land of Lincoln because I grew up in northern Indiana. And, you know, Lincoln just sort of captures your imagination. And then uh, I guess I would say I have just kind of been a Lincoln admirer through, you know, most of my life. So that's kind of where the, the crux of it came. 
And then, as far as getting to the work, um, I've been working with, for lack of a better word, old recipes, 19th century recipes for the past 20 years or so. And I started doing that work when we lived in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, and was doing some research to interpret the Jemison Van de Graaff Mansion, uh, which was being restored at that point in time. So I was kind of helping uh, from a public relations point of view, and I'm a lifelong cook. And then uh, as we began to approach the uh, 200th anniversary of Lincoln's birth a few years ago, my husband, who had been eating these old recipes, he'd come home from, from work and I'd say, well, okay, you've got 1862, 1847, 1885 on your plate. Tell me what you think. <laughs> okay. And, and all of the foods were so good, you know, that that's why I got sucked into doing all of this research and cooking and really great eating. So my husband said, as, you know, uh, as we sat down to Thanksgiving dinner, and you know Lincoln is, of course, connected with making Thanksgiving a national holiday, um, my husband asked sort of the critical question, well, what do you think Abraham Lincoln ate? Well, I thought it would be an easy subject to research and write. And six years later, here's the book. <laughs> yeah. Now, my question for you is, do we know if Lincoln actually cooked himself or we, if he had other people do it for him? We have some very strong clues that he did indeed cook himself. Uh, one that is, is dead on is that when he, with his stepbrother and cousin, were hired by Denton Offutt to build a flatboat, and take a load of, of farm produce down from central Illinois down to New Orleans to sell. Um, they arrived to build the flatboat, and his cousin and stepbrother elected Lincoln Cook. And that's what one of them wrote in, in uh, when he was interviewed by Lincoln's law partner, gathering all of the information he could about Lincoln after the assassination. So we know he cooked on the banks of the Sangamon River when he was making, building the flatboat, and then when they went on down the river. We also know that as, he, as a child, when his mother died, he and his older sister would have been charged with continuing to keep the household going. There really was not a strong support community around them. They were one of the first settlers in that part of Indiana. So he would have, you know, like any pioneering child who's raised in a one-room log cabin, you are essentially raised in the kitchen. So he would have known how to do that. And, and then when he was a lawyer, um, another neighbor in Springfield reports that Abraham Lincoln would come home, put on a blue apron, and help Mary in the kitchen. So in the 1850s, when they have, you know, rambunctious boys running through the house, Lincoln comes home and does what he can to get the dinner on the table. That's, that's very cool. And again, we're talking to Ray Catherine Amy. She is the author of Abraham Lincoln in the Kitchen. It's a culinary view of Lincoln's life and times. And so he, not only was he elected president, but he was elected to cook. Really? <laughs> <That's> what, <laughs> yes, you're right. He was. <laughs> so, um, so Ray, wh when you're researching these recipes, uh, take us through the – because – and it's one thing I want to tell the listeners. Um, we're going to open the lines later, so you'll get to call in and actually ask Ray some questions about Abraham Lincoln and about her research and her recipes, and she's been nice enough to allow us to make one of the recipes from her book because her book has 52 recipes in it from the life and times of Abraham Lincoln. So we're going to 52. It's, it's says been 55. revised. So we're going to actually make a recipe from the book, and that recipe that we're going to make is posted on our website at justcookit.net. So, Ray, thank, number one, thank you for allowing us to make the recipe and to post it for our listeners. Oh, and it's, my, it's my pleasure. I, you know, the joy comes from, you know, sharing these recipes with other people because, I, you know, I've always felt that when you can taste and make and taste an authentic food from an era, you get a different perspective on what life was like. Absolutely. And, you know, just reading it, because it's not just a cookbook. There are the 50-some-odd the recipes in the book, but you actually, there's a lot of text before the recipes that actually explain, that you actually explain the recipes, um, the significance behind them, and incorporate them into the life of Lincoln and where they came from. So how do you go about, re because ingredients have changed over the years from the 1800s until today. You can't uh, go to the local supermarket and get the same exact foods that Lincoln 
Lincoln would have cooked with or that Lincoln would have eaten. So how do you adapt those foods from yesteryear into today? Well, you've hit the nail right on the head, uh, Mario. What I, or what I try to do, <coughs> excuse me, <laughs> getting choked up there, is uh, is to make the recipes and interpret them so that cooks in modern kitchens can make them easily. And you're right, some of the ingredients are difficult to find. Some are impossible. I mean, for example, Mary Todd Lincoln's almond cake, the original recipe called for both sweet and bitter almonds. Well, bitter almonds are poisonous, oh, okay. and you and you can't <laughs> buy them. So, but the, the very clever people who make, okay. who make flavoring extracts have found a way to get that almond flavor which is more pungent from bitter okay. almonds so you know I adapted that recipe increased uh, you know tinkered with it a little bit to get the same amount of, of bulk and then you know from the bitter and the sweet and then added some some almond extract the leavening is a particularly interesting journey to take when you're working with old recipes because you don't have I mean we commonly have baking soda and baking right. powder, mm -hmm. and some folks still use cream of tartar. Mm -hmm. But when you go way, way back, um, you don't even, you don't have chemical leaveners at all. You know, you're, you're left with yeast, mm -hmm. or you know, whipping egg whites into a frenzy of fluffiness. Mm -hmm. But then you. I love that from with my pancakes, by the way. Oh yeah, I love I love what you get with beaten egg whites. It's just it's just a wonderful structure. <laughs> um, you get something called pearl ash, which actually comes from the ash of burned trees, which then became something called saleratus, S-A-L-E-R-A-T-U-S, which is the equivalent of baking soda. So uh, for recipes that use saleratus, I've discovered that, you know, if you just substitute baking soda, it works just fine. Well, then you begin to see in the literature, and you can see in one of the sources that I used to develop the information was um, grocery ledgers from where the Lincoln had, Lincolns had charged things at a couple of stores in Springfield. So there's a whole year of charge records from one store. I'm sure they bought from more than one store. But in this one store, I just put them out. I made an Excel spreadsheet, and I put everything out to see on a, on a calendar what they bought, when they bought it. And you see that Mary Lincoln is buying baking soda and cream of tartar in the exact proportion that you need for all the recipes. And when you combine those, you get baking powder. So, so then, and you see baking powder commonly purchased not until after the Civil War. So there's this progression, so that's kind of how I work through all of the leavening and to get these really luscious light things. Um, you know, there's a, there's a uh, sour milk biscuit in the book, which again is just kind of an education in what you can learn from taking a mouthful, of, you know, a good bite of a, an authentic food. You know, we're all used to biscuits being these light fluffy things, mm -hmm. and, and there's nothing wrong with a baking powder biscuit. I like them a lot. But when you take this sour milk biscuit, which is leavened with the chemical interaction between the sour milk and baking soda, you get this chewy, full-flavored, sturdy, in a good way, food. And you can understand how soldiers and others could see biscuits as sustaining food. Yeah, you're making my mouth water. <laughs> <laughs> Who would have thought sour idea. milk? Sour milk, yeah. <laughs> so, Ray, we're going to have to take a quick break here. So we're going to go to break and uh, play some messages from our sponsors. When we come back, though, you're going to stay on the stay on the line with us, correct? Absolutely. Be and delighted to. We're going to start cooking, so I'm going to have to ask you to walk me through your recipe because no one knows your recipe better than you do. I just hope I, I don't mess it up too much. Oh, I don't think you can. That's, okay. that's the advantage of a lot of these things. Some of them are picky, but most of them are not. Okay. okay great. So we're talking to Ray Catherine Amy. She's the author of Abraham Lincoln in the Kitchen. And when we get back, we're going to begin making a recipe from her book as she walks us through it so don't touch that radio dial we will be back with more just cook it on the just cook it radio network right after these messages phil gianetti motors at 656 national pike east in brownsville is a proud sponsor of programming on fctv 
Phil Ginetti Motors, providing quality vehicles for 45 years. If you're looking for a quality pre-owned vehicle, give Phil Giannetti's a call at 724-785-6800 or stop by their website, philgiannettimotors.com. Welcome back to Just Cook It Radio, Mario and Bill in studio, and on the phone line right now we have Ray Catherine Amy, the author of Abraham Lincoln in the Kitchen, a Culinary View of Lincoln's Life and Times. Good morning. Good morning. So I finally realized why Mary Todd was out of her mind. She was eating bad almonds. <laughs> I mean, well. I, I, I finally realized what the cause was. Well, I don't know about that. It's a good theory. It's a very good theory. But we can say it now. Who's going to argue with us, right? Exactly I mean, right. <laughs> but uh, no, so, so your interest in Lincoln, as you said, it goes back to your childhood. But did you, did you whenever you, you did this, like you said, it took six years to write the book, and you were looking at these recipes, did you think other people would be interested in two? Um, did you think? that because of the big new uh, infatuation we have with Lincoln with the movies that have come out and the newest one that came out, I guess it was two years ago, that was an Academy Award winner and everything else, that now is the time to bring the book out because of the, the Lincoln, the nostalgia, and uh, this big fad that we have now in the country with our cooking uh, nostalgia type recipes. Well, you know, I'm, I, those are very good points, and I'm not sure that I was that deliberately analytical about it. Well, you um, can say your word. No one's going to know. <laughs> but I sure hope people do, you know, <laughs> buy the book. <laughs> um, it was just something that, that quite frankly, um, once I started to do the, the cooking and the reading and the research, it really grabbed a hold of me. Mm -hmm. And so I did just kind of us to continue with it until I would see where the journey through the kitchen and through the libraries would take me. And what I was very pleased to have happen as an end result is that I was able to weave the food and the history together in kind of a way that, that gives me, and I hope readers, a way to look at the history because the, the, the narrative of the book is as much biographical and cultural as it is is keyed to the recipes. So there are chapters that talk about life in Springfield that kind of analyze what might have explore what happened in the in the Lincoln kitchen from um, the perspective of, of what they found in you know in exploring uh, you know, kind of a trash heap you know what kind of bones they right. found. So it's it's you know it's a cookbook because the recipes are all there and they, and they're, I hope they're accessible to cooks. We'll find out <laughs> in a minute as you're cooking one of them, but it really talks as much about Lincoln's life and Mary's life, and I'm a, you know, there are two schools about Mary, well, maybe more than that, but there are those who think that she was just kind of this awful, awful person um, who screamed and yelled and, and, you know, was suffered from mental illness. Um, I tend to have come through this journey as and as a, a Mary defender, because when you think about it, you know Lincoln grew up in the log cabin and knew what it, what kitchen and cooking was. She grew up in a very cultured home uh, in Lexington, where there were slaves who ran the kitchen. So she, you know, there's some narrative that suggests you know that she, as a young child, would kind of run through the kitchen and you know have kind of intimate dealings with the women who were working there and. And, um, but when she got to Springfield, she came to visit her older sister who had married the son of the former governor of Illinois. So again, you're in a high social status, but there aren't slaves in Illinois, and the women are doing their own work, or they have hired girls. Right. So Mary comes, and you know, through a long courtship, they end up living in a small cottage after they're married. She, it's a three-room cottage, and there she's there with some help, but not much. A toddler, pregnant, and cooking on an open hearth. She which, doesn't have a stove. Which had to be a cultural shock to her because she's going from one 
one class system to another class system. But she loved Lincoln. Mm -hmm. She and she saw, I think, what their life could be together. She she had aspirations to marry a man who would be president, and she found the man who could be that. She saw and, potential. Yes, yeah, she saw the potential. <laughs> But not only that, I think there's the love between the two of them, and I think it's expressed in the way she ran the household, Okay, is is a powerful one, I think. So I'm a big Mary Defender. And I, I can see why she needs defending, because she has been portrayed as not a nice person in history. Yes. And yes. especially in the recent movie where Sally Field played the part, where she played it excellently, by the way, um, she's not coming across as a very... Very, um, a very nice person. But again, it had to do. They they blame some of it on the loss of a child too. Yes. Yeah. Um, she lost. Well, she lost two children. Two children. Yeah. And she lost. They lost Eddie when they lived in Springfield, and he was four when he died. And then in the White House, Willie died. Yes. Uh, and Willie was this, from all you read, just this marvelous, marvelous. Um, charming, intelligent, sweet, sweet child. You know, it just kind of breaks your heart to think, you know, at, at the loss of that person and that potential. Right. So, not to interrupt, but... <laughs> I, I, I'm getting my history this lesson is, for this, this morning. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. I'm having a good time just sitting here listening, but why don't you, Ray, if you don't mind, again, we're talking to Ray Catherine Amy, the author of Abraham Lincoln in the Kitchen. Why don't you uh, give us a little brief introduction to the recipe we're going to be making today, and then uh, we can actually get started with it. Sure, sure. We're making a, a chicken salad, which is a little different from the kinds of chicken salads that we commonly eat today. This uh, recipe is, is sort of a common one of the era. It's not one that I can definitely say that Mary or Abraham Lincoln made, except the style is one that you see throughout the, um, the cookbooks of the era and the cookbooks of that place and time. And what's special about it, well, there are two things. Excuse me just a sec. <clears throat> is that it's equal parts, um, you know, our chicken salads are, are pretty much all meat. Well, uh -huh. here you have two cups of, of chicken, uh -huh. a cup of celery, and a cup of shredded lettuce. Uh -huh. So you're equal part meat and vegetation. And instead of using mayonnaise, I mean, mayonnaise was invented, um, some folks say, about 1750. But you really don't, and, but it wasn't put in a jar <laughs> until the 1900s. Hellman's didn't corrupt it until the 1900s? Yeah, exactly. Well, so, and mayonnaise, let's face it, is a little putsy to make, mm -hmm. um, you know, dealing with the, the raw egg yolks and all. So what you see commonly is a dressing made from a hard-cooked egg yolk, and then you mash that with some mustard and some olive oil. I've seen other, and a little bit of vinegar to make the, the dressing. I've seen other versions where they even put a little horseradish in there to give it even mm -hmm. more snap. And, you know, what I would like, what I like to do when I make this recipe is combine the dressing with the chicken and maybe the chicken and the celery, depending how long I'm going to want to make it in advance. Okay. And then toss it with the lettuce at the very end. Okay. So you do retain that, that crispness from the lettuce. And the more you leave the dressing in contact with just the chicken, mm -hmm. the more it kind of imbues the chicken with that, that nice, sharp flavor, too. So it's a really nice recipe. And it's pretty easy, I think. I'm looking forward to trying it. So what I've done so far... And you can kind of walk me through this. Sure. I've removed the yolk from the hard-boiled egg. I've mashed it in a bowl, and okay. I've added the uh, the mustard. I'm going to add the olive oil here in a minute. And I've also diced the the egg white and reserved it for garnish, as per the recipe. Excellent. Okay. Now, the one thing I'm noticing, because usually when we cook in the studio, I got stuff in front of me everywhere. <laughs> and I'm looking at this. There's only seven ingredients. Well, well maybe a little more than eight. seven. Eight. Yeah, eight. Eight. Not a lot. Not a lot. But this looks really easy. Even I can make this. Well, good. No. <laughs> I mean, even I could do this. <laughs> And it's, you know, if you've got some leftover chicken sitting around, it's a good way to use that up. Um, 
It was said that Mary's sister, Elizabeth, um, who was the one who married Ninian Edwards, the son of the governor, former governor, um, was famous for her chicken salad. And it was the kind of thing back then that you would, huh. the churches, in order to raise money to do good deeds, would have potlucks. And they would charge people to come mm -hmm. and fill up their potluck plates. So they were saying that the churches were built in Springfield on the strength of Mrs. Edwards' chicken salad and another <laughs> woman's rolls and someone else's cake. <laughs> now, here's a question for you, Ray. Sure. When Now, I've made a ton of dressings in my time, too many to count, <laughs> and <laughs> the general rule of thumb is, especially with any kind of emulsion or whatnot, you slowly drizzle in the fat or the olive oil while whisking. Now, this one kind of turns it on its head, where you add the olive oil into the, with, the egg, with the mustard, which is the emulsifier, and the egg yolk, and then you actually drizzle in the vinegar as you whisk. Is there a reason for that? Well, you know, it's hard to know who the develop why the developer of the recipe created it that way um, you know it, it's hard to, to go back into the invention of inventive cooks minds in the 1800s but I'm thinking you, you again sort of hit the hit the nail on the head because you have essentially two emulsifiers you've got the, the mustard and the egg yolk uh -huh. you know that you don't have to create the, the emulsification with the the oil and the vinegar in the typical way I think because you've got those two things going for you, it'll hold together better so you know, as well. So, so far you've put in, you've put the yolk, you've put yes. the mustard, you put the olive oil, yes. and now you're going to do the vinegar. Right. Okay. So, Ray, I'm just going to drizzle the vinegar in just like as I would in oil while I whisk? Uh, it, sounds like a, it sounds like a good thing, and I will cross my fingers that it works. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> if it doesn't work, we're going to have a really long rest of the show. Uh, it's going to no, work. No, well, then, no, then you'll just have to get out your whisk uh, okay. and, you know, really beat it up. I think it'll be fine, though. I'll um, with the muscles you would have developed from beating carpets on the clothesline. Ah, very uh, true, yeah. <laughs> Ray, I'll tell you what I told everyone. Everyone who works for me and everyone that I, I teach cooking classes to, as long as it's not burned beyond recognition, I can fix it. Yeah. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> so, and, I've been, and I've been there. <laughs> yeah, you, we all have. So I've added the vinegar. Okay. And it's looking really good. Excellent. So we've got our dressing here. And I also want to... I want to open up the lines now, if that's okay with you, Ray. That's, oh, I'd love to talk to people. We'll see if, uh, see if we can get some callers to call in and ask some questions about the book, about Abraham Lincoln, about his, uh, the food that he would eat and cook, and anything they want to talk about Lincoln-related. Our number, 855-590-0590. Again, toll-free, 855-590-0590. Feel free to call in and talk to Ray Catherine Amy. She's the author of Abraham Lincoln in the Kitchen. And the book can actually be purchased if you go to our website, the recipe for today's show show is, uh, is posted. It was posted right before we went on the air. And if you go to the bottom of the recipe, there is a link you can click on and you can purchase the book directly from Amazon from that link. And I'll mention if any of your listeners would like an autographed copy, the Abraham Lincoln Bookshop in Chicago, you can Google them and find them pretty easily, does have a stock of autographed copies. Oh, wow. Hey, now, one thing we've always talked about on the show, not only talk food, but we also talk drink. What would, drink, what would Lincoln drink? I mean, what would be the the, the, the accompanying drink or beverage with this chicken salad? Well, Lincoln was not a, a big consumer of alcoholic beverages. Okay. Um, he drank milk, he drank coffee, he drank tea, he drank water. Okay. Um, so just kind of the common the common things that, that one would have, um, you know, available in, in any kitchen. Okay, so now that our dressing's made, I'm going to go ahead and add the chicken. Now, Ray, when you make this chicken salad, or when you develop the recipe, how did you cook the chicken? I usually, you know, for these kinds of recipes, I usually boil it. Okay. Because you know, then you get the, the classic twofer. You've got, you know, chicken broth, and then mm -hmm. you've got cooked chicken. But any kind of cooked chicken would work. Um, you could even use a rotisserie chicken from the grocery store. Mm -hmm. Although that will have, you know, the additional flavors from, mm -hmm. you know, whatever the store puts on it. But it wouldn't so, hurt. So let me tell you what I did. I got uh, chicken breast, mm -hmm. and I actually just I seasoned it. I didn't want to over-season it due to the, the seasoning in the recipe, so I just hit it with a touch of olive oil, some salt and pepper, and I roasted it on a roasting rack, 350 degree oven, just until the internal temperature hit about between 155 and 160 degrees. Pulled it out, I let it rest for about five minutes, and then I diced it. it sounds perfect. So, okay, and right now we have Alan on the phone. Let's go to yeah. Alan's call. How you doing? Alan, welcome. And I like your show. Well, thank you very much. What I wanted to know was, if we're talking about
about the era of what, 1860, something like that? Between, well, the book covers Lincoln's life, so we're talking about 1809 to 1865. I want to know, what was the availability of olive oil during that era? Was it readily available or was it scarce? It was readily available, as far as I can tell, in urban areas. So if you're looking on the east coast of the United States, if you're looking around New Orleans, which was a huge major port, it was available. And one thing that I explore in the book is how transportation brought foods initially up from New Orleans to the central part of Illinois, and then that's when the railroads long, come in... That's a long in, boat ride. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> well, yeah, um, at eight miles an hour on a steamboat, it'll, it'll get you there. Um, but then by the 1850s, the railroaders, railroad is coming across, and you begin to see more and more things available. And so you do see in the grocery store lists of what we have available, olive oil in Springfield, Illinois, in the 1850s. Okay, well, that answers my question. Thank you very much. Thanks I'll for calling, Alan. Listen. Yeah, Alan, thanks, thanks for the call. Thank thanks you. for listening. Bye. Now, you, you talk about the grocery store, and we think of the grocery store today in comparison. You're basically talking about a one-room store. Didn't they, did they have to, like, pre-order what they wanted so they could get? Because you know they wouldn't have all this stock on the end. Well, it's, I mean, that's another amazing thing. You're absolutely, absolutely right. In the, the initial years of life in Springfield in the 18. 18- 30s, you see really small little stores, yeah. and you see people, you know, with, with just whatever the merchants were willing to take a risk on yeah. to bring in as stock. But by the 1840s, as Springfield becomes the capital of the state of Illinois, you begin, you begin to see this huge influx of people. The population of Springfield tripled from the 1830s to the 1840s. So you're looking at a community of 7,500 people, yep. and it's a sophisticated community with people. Um, the initial settlers came from the central part of, of the country, so you have people from Kentucky and Tennessee. Then you begin to get New Englanders. Then you begin to get people from Portugal. There was a, a nice population from Portugal. You begin huh. to see Germans. There was a huge German community. Lincoln, at one point in time, owned a German-language newspaper. Um, huh. And he, he had nothing to do with what went in it, except he said when he bought it to support it, that it should carry the Republican line. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, no mystery there. Yeah. Um, and then there were people of color, free people of okay. color who lived in the community, and Irish. So you have all of these people wanting their homeland foods. Right. So the stores began to stock them. And when you look at, and there were 22 grocery stores in Springfield. Oh, wow. In the in the 1850s. Because when I think of the grocery store back then, I think of what we, what's we what been portrayed on TV from what we saw in Little House on the Prairie, what we saw in the Waltons, and, and what we saw in Green Acres with Sam Drucker's <laughs> store. Because I think of that being a type of a situation. And even around here where we are, you had a lot of patch stores that did the same thing in the uh, turn of the century. You, you know, they did have limited stock. Yeah. But you see them, you know, advertising what they have. Okay. And, and it's, some of it's pretty pretty sophisticated. I mean, one thing that, that's two things that struck me were um, oysters, <laughs> that in the 1840s and the early 1850s, you can get oysters in Springfield. Oh, wow. In, in, and they're coming up the river from, you know, from New Orleans, from Baltimore. So they're Wait. coming all the way around. From Baltimore to New Orleans to, okay, yeah. sure, that makes sense. Yeah, and then, and then the, well, before the, the railroads. Travel I know, I understand. Before, and then when the railroads come, you know, they come straight across. Gotcha. The other thing that, that you see is the prevalence of citrus fruit. Okay. You know, lemons and oranges, you know, again, coming, some, one of the ads said, from Havana. Okay. So, you, you know, the, ad, the stores are advertising where things are coming from, um, you know, and they get, they're getting, you know, strawberries and tomatoes, as we do now, ahead of our natural season, they were beginning to get them, too. So it was just, you know, I have this whole chapter about transportation and what that means to the mm-hmm. foodways and what it meant to what the Lincolns and their neighbors could eat. Interesting. So, while you were talking, I added the celery to our okay. chicken salad. And I diced some romaine, or not diced, I shredded some romaine. 
So we have all the ingredients. I, I guess the last step is to fold the romaine into the chicken salad? Uh, or the other way around. You know, toss, them, okay. toss them together. I was sort of not specific about okay. which you add to which. <laughs> well, okay. It's all the same anyway, right? <laughs> Six of one, half dozen of the other. Yeah. yeah. So just to rehash the recipe really quickly, and uh, then we're going to have to take our final break, and we'll come back and taste everything. Again, we're talking to Ray Catherine Amy. She is the author of Abraham Lincoln in the Kitchen. And uh, we're making the chicken salad from the book, from the Abraham Lincoln era. So we started with a hard-boiled egg. We removed the yolk, crushed or uh, just lightly mashed that up with some um, Dijon mustard, some olive oil, and then we whisked in some vinegar. That made the dressing for the chicken salad. And then we took some diced cooked chicken, folded that in with also two cups of chicken, one cup of celery, diced celery, folded that all together, and then at that point, Ray, you would probably cover it and put it in the refrigerator? Yes, yeah, or, I mean, depending on how quickly you want to eat, I mean, you could, as you're doing now, just whip it together right before, you know, serving it, but I do think you get a little bit of a better flavor, and the celery begins to add a little bit more moisture as the dressing, you know, draws some of that moisture mm -hmm. out, so, you know, I think it's a little bit tastier if you let it sit around in the fridge for an hour or so, or even overnight. Okay. Okay. And then we have some shredded romaine. Now, what, what other lettuce do you like to use for this recipe? I like the romaine because it's sturdy, and it, it gives you a, a good you know, mouth bite. I, you could use whatever you had around. Um, you could even use, you know, something as delicate as a, a butterhead lettuce if you wanted to. Um, you know, trusty old iceberg is, is always available. I don't think it has the same kind of flavor. It um, doesn't. If you wanted to get fancy. <laughs> to me, it tastes like water. Water, yeah. yeah. Well, you know, it serves its purpose. <laughs> <laughs> it's crunchy. That's about it. Um, yeah. So whatever lettuce you had around would work. I think the the key is to have something that is, you know, shredded or chopped if you didn't want it to shred so that you've got kind of equivalent sizes of, you know, the the celery and the chicken and the, the lettuce. Mm -hmm. Now, before we go to break, Ray, I have one question for you. Um, what's your favorite recipe from the book? Like, which recipe did was the, the most fun to develop and which one is your favorite to eat? Oh, you are a wicked person to ask me to choose among them. Um, which I mean, child is your favorite? No, yes, I'm yeah. I'm, I mean, I'm just looking at in the book, and right across from the chicken salad is the strawberry ice cream. Yes, I see that recipe. Which is a really nice recipe because the, the, um, the, the fruit-flavored ice creams of the era have... Uh, ha again, it's this kind of half and half thing. You've got half a cream constituent, and then you have the berries that are mashed in their juice. So you have sort of a mouthfeel that's a combination of Italian ice and rich ice cream. Mm -hmm. So it's really good. And the interesting thing about this ice cream recipe is there's no egg yolks in it. There's no You're not really making the uh, traditional ice cream base that most of us are used to. No, no. You're, you're just mixing the fruit and the fruit juice and the milk and the cream. There's no, there's no binding per se. Um, no gelatin or, um, or as you're saying, egg yolks, not a cooked custard. Um, so it's, you know, it's again, it's kind of one of these simple things and it's really good. But I think my favorite um, of a meat kind of recipe is the, um, the slow-cooked barbecue, which you just, you take the meat, and I use chicken thighs, and you marinate them in just molasses for, you know, a couple of hours or overnight. Then when you're ready to cook, you wipe the molasses off and then just cook them and then dab them with a little salt water, either on the grill or in a slow oven. And it, the molasses is kind of soaked into the meat and you just get this wonderful, rich flavor. It's just really, really wonderful. And I can envision, you know, Lincoln chewing on a turkey leg as he did at the county fair in Urbana, Illinois, um, at a particular political barbecue that he went to. Well, that sounds great. And again, Ray, we're going to take our final break. When we come back, we're going to try the chicken salad, and we're going to ask you a few more questions, if you don't mind. My pleasure. For the final 10 minutes or so. So don't touch that radio dial. More with Ray Catherine Amy, the author of Abraham Lincoln in the Kitchen, when we come back to Just Cook It on the Just Cook It radio network. Phil Giannetti Motors at 656 National Pike East in Brownsville is a proud sponsor of programming on FCTV. Phil GNA Motors providing quality vehicles for 45 years. If you're looking for a quality pre-owned vehicle, give Phil GNA's a call at 724-785-6800 or stop by their website, Phil GNA Motors. 
www.thepodcastnetwork.com. Welcome back to Just Cook It Radio. On the phone line, we have Ray Catherine Amy, and we're making her chicken salad from her book, Abraham Lincoln in the Kitchen. And you can get the book if you go to justcookit.net, click on the recipe, which Ray has so generously allowed us to post since we're making it today. At the bottom, not only can you make the recipe and try the one that we're making in studio today, but you can go to the bottom there and click the link to buy the book. So I definitely recommend picking it up. There's some great recipes in it, and um, it's a just r really interesting read. And, Thanks. And, and Thanks. I, um, Ray, I don't know if you heard us in, the, us in studio in between the uh, break, but we were talking about how enjoyable today's show was because we've learned a lot about Lincoln and just being able to talk about just his eating habits and his uh, styles and what was going on at that time period. Oh, thanks so much for saying that, Bill. No, I didn't hear your oh. um, your comments. <laughs> Now, so, now we know. Anyhow, uh, but so, no, it was. It, it has been very enjoyable this morning. Yeah, Thank you. The story, it, has, it has for me too. The stories are very interesting, and I'm even more looking forward to trying this chicken salad. So, to plate it up, what do you you just put it on the plate, Ray, and garnish it with the egg white? You could do that. Um, you know, you could put you know a, a large lettuce leaf underneath. Uh -huh. You know, to kind of give it a little bit of color on the plate. Right. Um, you know, I again, as I was thinking about this recipe, I was thinking of it being served in the context of a church. Function. Fundraisers, so you know somebody would make a huge big bowl of it, and folks would come on through and, and scoop you know, it out. There's spoonful, um, but you know whatever people would like to do. I think if you're serving it for a luncheon or a, a light supper, I think it probably does need some sort of anchor, um, and a, a lettuce leaf would always be handy for that. And one thing that we were also discussing during the break, um, this recipe, as many of them are in the book, are actually not bad for you. No, no, I, you know, I didn't really approach it from a healthy cooking point of view, although that's sort of my natural tendency anyway. I think we all sort of need to think about that these days. But when you look at the foods, you know, back then, you're essentially, you know, farm, farm to table. So, you know, that's, that's kind of where you are with, yeah. you know, with, the, you know, essential foods from the farm. I mean, Lincoln was raised on a farm mm -hmm. and then in Springfield surrounded by the, the farm economy. As you yeah. can tell by my crunching, it's very good. It is. <laughs> it is. And we advocate a lot of farm to table here on the show and we're all about, you know, as much organic as possible and the healthier eating and that's why with this recipe we noticed that right away. Mm -hmm. And it's, a, this is an actual, it's the, the, this chicken salad from the book Abraham Lincoln in the Kitchen, it's different than yes. your traditional chicken salad. It's lighter. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's, um, yeah. It's got those vinegary notes, but you can still taste the Dijon because, as we said earlier, the two emulsifiers that are in there that kind of hold it together. Yeah, yeah. And the chicken is still moist, but it's coated nicely, and you get kind of a, a small amount of crunch from the from the celery, but not as much as you do from the romaine, which I can see now why you want that sturdy romaine to really yeah. hold up to the vinegar in the chicken yeah, um, in yeah. the dish. Yeah, well, I'm so glad you like it. It, it is, you know, I was glad you picked this one to cook it because it is one of my favorites. Yeah, it's very, very good. So and, di and different, you know, so it's, it's giving you, you know, a perspective again on the era when you look at how the, the dressing is made differently and the, yes. the different proportions from what we're used to of, of meat to veg. Are there any recipes in the book that were kind of, and we have like one minute left, so <laughs> are there any recipes in the book that if someone buys the book that you recommend they should make right away? I would make the gingerbread men right away because that is a recipe that is a kind of one that Lincoln almost told us. He said his mother in Indiana used to get sorghum, used to get ginger, and make gingerbread men that he could put in his, put in his pocket and his young friend could eat in two bites. Okay. So from that, I went to period sources and kind of triangulated to get what I think is the accurate recipe for gingerbread man and Lincoln's gingerbread man and as with the chicken salad and the ice cream and the barbecue it's very different from what we expect but it's mm -hmm. really really good yes well, it is I just want to say thank you Ray for giving us the time and for being on the whole program this was awesome we learned a lot of great stuff it was really enjoyable to have you on and we'd love to have you on again in the future if you're interested it would be my pleasure I want to talk to you about the uh, soda 
to Shop Salvation in the future. I would be delighted to do that. Fantastic. Okay. Well, thanks so much again, Ray Catherine Amy, the author of Abraham Lincoln in the Kitchen, a culinary view of Lincoln's life and times. You can get the book from our website at justcookit.net along with the recipe that we made on today's program. And as always, we will be back next Saturday at 9 a.m. with another episode of Just Cook It. Any parting words, gentlemen? No, it's been a fun show, and it's a great chicken salad. Absolutely. We're going to enjoy that again. Thank you to Ray. And uh, go to the website and pick up a copy of the book. For Jim Morgan and Bill Alexander, I'm Mario Pareca. Thank you for listening. We'll talk to you next week on Just Cook It on the Just Cook It Radio Network. Thanks for listening to Just Cook It Radio with Mario Pareca and Bill Alexander. For more information on today's program, visit the Just Cook It website at justcookit.net. Here, you can listen to the podcast or watch Mario and Bill cook today's recipe on Just Cook It TV. If you have any questions or comments about the show, please call 855-590-0590.